And now we're getting ready for our segment, Get Connected with Tricia Crane. Good morning, my name is Tricia Powell Crane and I'm the Executive Director of the Alabama School Connection. You've joined us here uh, on the Alabama Way at the Get Connected segment. So this is where we talk a little bit about schools and what's happening in our K-12 environment. This morning, I am thrilled to have Duncan Kirkwood, Duncan Elliott Kirkwood, um, who is the State Director for the Black Alliance for Educational Options. We often call it BAO, and you'll hear us talk about BAO. And Duncan is here to talk with us today about um, school choice in Alabama. You know, there's a lot that's been going on in the last couple of years, it's kept me busy. And um, Duncan's organization works with families He's going to tell us more about the organization, but works with families. So I thought that he could really bring a lot to this conversation and tell us what's happening and, <laughs> you know, what's the latest and what do we need to be thinking about. So, Duncan, thank you for being here. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Um, I, I know that you're based in Montgomery, so I appreciate you making the drive. Mm. Um, if you would, tell us a little bit about BAO, about the Black Alliance for Educational Options. Okay, absolutely. So I guess I'll start uh, maybe about 20 years ago. Mm. Um, there was a, a, a new movement in this country, a, a wave. You know, for, for years we felt like that we as a community, as America, we, if there was a poor community, right, you know, dad's not in the home, crime, all of this stuff, if there was an underserved community, then the school was going to be bad, mm -hmm. right? That was just kind of, everybody just kind of take that for granted. That's the inner city, that's this, that's that, it's going right. to be a bad school. Right. Um, but around 20 years ago, people started thinking, what if the bad school the habitually failing school is keeping the community subjugated, right? Mm. Because if kids are flunking out of school, then they're turning to crime. They're not getting jobs. They're not opening businesses. Right. But if the schools were thriving and kids were going to college, right. kids were opening businesses, learning trades, mm -hmm. then all of a sudden that community would be uplifted. Mm -hmm. um, so there was this new kind of reform movement that got started with vouchers um, and charter schools and all of these different new ways to think about education and the way education is delivered. Um, but at that time, this movement was largely led by white folks, mm -hmm. you know, and they were doing a good job. They weren't malicious. They had good ideas. But when we talk about public schools, more often than not, we're talking about black and brown children. Mm -hmm. But there wasn't that representation in the conversation. So 15 years ago, uh, 50 black educators came together mm -hmm. in Washington, D.C., and they had this conference where they created this organization called BAO, uh, the Black Alliance for Educational Options. And the idea was to not just be a part of this reform movement, mm -hmm. but to be leaders in this movement. Mm -hmm. um, so that was kind of how Bayo was formed. Uh, now you fast forward to today. Um, Bayo has been in and out of several states. Uh, we've done great work. We are, right now we're in four states, mm -hmm. uh, Louisiana, uh, New Jersey, Tennessee, and Alabama. Okay. I'm the state director here in Alabama. And we're primarily a parent choice organization. So we're carrying the flag for parent choices. Mm -hmm. uh, and we call it parent choice instead of school choice because school choice, it sounds like the school's making the choice. It, it just mm -hmm. has a different connotation. Yeah. We want people to understand that we want the parents to have the power to make a choice. Um, but we also support transformational education reform initiatives. Um, so not just school choice or parent choice rather, but also the, the other uh, issues in the ed reform space and the, and the gamut of issues. Uh, so that's kind of how Bayo came to be and what we do now. Uh, here in Alabama, uh, we believe in all the options. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's very important that we explain to folks that Bayo is not like, you know, charter schools are going to save the world or, right, you know, this school right. is bad. We support traditional public schools. Mm -hmm. Often I'm asked to come speak and do inspirational speaking at our traditional public schools in Montgomery. Uh, some of our staff here in Birmingham, uh, which I'll talk about in just a second, okay. they uh, do some volunteer work. They have mentees in the traditional public schools. So, you know, we're not against traditional public schools. We support traditional public schools. We support magnet schools because that's mm -hmm. an option. Mm -hmm. We support homeschool. We support uh, blended learning and virtual schools. Mm -hmm. And we support scholarships for uh, low-income families to go to private schools. Mm -hmm. We support charter schools. Uh, so it's not one is better than the other. It's here's this list of options. And people who have money have access to these options, and they always have. Yeah. But people who do not, who are low income or who are in the working class, don't always have access to these options. So by and large in Alabama especially, they're forced to go to a school based on their zip code. Now, right. if they hit the lucky draw and they live close to Hoover, then, you know, hey, you know, they, it's great for them. Mm -hmm. But if they live near a school that's failing, then they have no way out. 
And then now what we're seeing is families lying about where their kids live, mm -hmm. uh, sending their kids to live with a loved one just so they live in a different school district um, and then go to a different school. And people are doing everything they can mm -hmm. to to try to ensure that they kid, their kids can get a quality education. Mm -hmm. uh, and then also in Alabama, uh, our staff, Neonta Williams, mm -hmm. she works here uh, in Birmingham as well as Krista Andrews. Mm -hmm. She's our state coordinator. Neonta's our family and community organizer. Pastor David Craig, he's our faith outreach leader. He lives in Fairfield uh, and he's the pastor of Mount Pilgrim. Um, and so we have a logistics coordinator that lives in Evergreen. I live in Montgomery and then we have a political consultant that lives in Mobile. Wow, that's a, that's a great uh, introduction to Bayo. Um, I know that I've seen you speak, I've listened to your um, uh, interviews, and I think you have a very powerful message, which is empowering parents and empowering families to make these kinds of choices. That's really where the Alabama School Connection comes from, you know, I inform people so that they can make their choices. And um, you mentioned some of the educational options that are, are available. You know, three years ago, 2012, we really had no options in Alabama. We had you go to public school or you go to private school or you go or you homeschool. And now, just in the last few years, we've had the tax credit scholarship program open up through the Alabama Accountability Act. And this year, we've had charter school legislation open up, um, which is still sort of being, you know, it's being formed right now. But these are, a lot of people have a lot of questions. Um, and unfortunately, education doesn't get the kind of coverage, media coverage, that we would like, which is also another reason why the Alabama School Connection exists. But parents really look for information. One of the things that you uh, mentioned about what Bayo does um, is that you, you do speak with groups, right? And so, so there are people uh, available to come to your neighborhood school. Right, or right. to meet with parent groups? Right, and so Bayo's job, we, are, we seek to convene parents okay. and empower communities. So the idea is that we don't want parents, we don't want Bayo to have to be leading a rally. Mm -hmm. We want to teach parents how to speak for themselves and advocate for themselves mm -hmm. so they can lead their own rallies, mm -hmm. whether it be for education, whether it be for crime, whether, whatever their issue is in their community, mm -hmm. we want to train them so that they can be a force so that they can be ready to speak to a school board member, know how to give testimony, know how to put a petition together, mm -hmm. know how to write a press release. We actually train parents to do these type of things. In addition, we work with um, PTAs and parent groups mm -hmm. to teach them how to have a better relationship with their, with their child's teacher, mm -hmm. to find out what, their child, what makes their child tick. We do workshops to help you know, traditional school parents, private school parents, um, because so for like the scholarship, a lot of those parents are first time private school parents. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a different world when you're a private school parent than when you're a traditional school parent. So we train those parents on how to be successful in that space. We train traditional school parents on how to be successful in their space. Uh, we really, and we organize student groups. Uh, we just started a pastor's coalition here in Birmingham of 26 faith leaders who all support uh, educational options and want to see education grow and are willing to stand and put their voice and power behind it. Wow. So it, it, it's about empowerment. And empowerment is scary, right? Because when you empower people, you know, that's it. You know, you, you know, you, the reins come off. You empower them and then they go and they go do their thing. Mm -hmm. And so for a lot of folks, that's scary. But for us at Bayo, too often our communities are left voiceless. Right. right? And so we want to help them to find their voice and use their voice to affect change in their communities. Uh, and that's students. We got college student groups. We have parent advocacy leaders. Mm -hmm. One of our parent advocacy leaders was just appointed to the statewide charter school commission up in, uh, as the, uh, she lives in Huntsville. Her mm -hmm. name is Gloria Batts. And she was one of our former parent advocacy leaders so our parents are, are becoming a force and we're about to start two new parent advocacy leader groups um, and like I said like you said Bayo is also open to come talk to schools yeah, talk to yeah. teachers talk to PTAs not just about school choice but about education in general or building a better relationship or helping make their school better well that is uh, all right so we're going to have contact information available on the screen here because uh, you might be calling Birmingham or you might be calling Montgomery. So we'll make sure that everybody has that information. But in a few minutes, we're going to start talking about um, what kind of, uh, what is school choice? What is parent choice? I like your term. So please stay with us and we'll be right back. Struggling to make your house payment? Life's twists and turns don't have to mean losing your home. Hardest Hit Alabama is a federally funded foreclosure prevention program. If you qualify, Hardest Hit Alabama can pay your mortgage payments on your behalf or provide other forms of assistance. 
We've helped thousands of Alabama homeowners, and we may be able to help you, too. Visit HardestHitAlabama.com to learn more. Hey there, Bob Baumhauer here. Last year, the Alabama State Park celebrated our 75th anniversary, but the fun really never ends. I'm happy because this year, special events and new promotions will help us reach out to those who have yet to visit a state park. In addition to providing family fun, our parks are located in some of the most beautiful parts of Alabama. So plan your next visit today. But this year, reach out and bring a friend. For more information, call 1-800-ALLAPARK or go to allapark.com. Welcome back. Um, you've joined us again here on the Get Connected segment of the Alabama Way. My name is Tricia Powell Crane. I'm Executive Director of the Alabama School Connection and Duncan Elliott Kirkwood has joined us here today. He is from the Black Alliance for Educational Options. He's the State Director for Alabama. Um, we refer to his organization as BAO. You'll hear us talk about BAO and that's to whom we're referring. And in our first segment, Duncan was giving us a wonderful background of what BAO is and what BAO does. And I'm hoping in this segment, um, you know, school choice, which I really like the way you call this parent choice. Um, I'm always open to new terminology. But, you know, parent choice in schooling is really fairly new to Alabama. Uh, we didn't have a lot of choices. It was public school or private school or home school. And in the last couple of years, we've had some choices open up. And it's created, um, you know, it, it's happened so quickly that, that there have been a lot of concerns. There's been a lot of, you know, I, I guess you would say pushback or just really worry about what does this mean for public education. Uh, Duncan made it clear that, you know, Bayo is in support of public schools. Uh, you know, we want safe public schools. We want good public schools. We want teachers teaching in public school who are well trained and certified and, and who are looking towards the future about what's best for kids. Um, so, but, you know, you and I, we, we talked a little bit about um, some of the tougher conversations that are going on in neighborhoods, particularly in black communities, um, that aren't real sure about this whole school choice thing. Absolutely. Well, what, do you, uh, what can you share about that? You know, how do you address people's concerns? Because it's hard to get to everybody, right? So uh, how could you share some of their concerns and um, how to address them? Right, so a couple things. First, this choice movement mm -hmm. uh, is also choice for educators, mm -hmm. right? Because I've talked to a number of educators, principals uh, and teachers who, who feel like they can't, their hands are tied. You know, a principal might say, I know what needs to be done, but I can't do it because of policy and my hands are tied. Mm -hmm. Or teachers say, I want to teach, and I know I have all these great ideas, but I have to do this, you know, lesson plan every day. I've got these team meeting. I've got this planning period. I'm calling home every day. Mm -hmm. I, I'm calling all these kids' houses. I don't have time to really put together all these. So, uh, you know, these choice type of schools will give teachers the freedom to really teach in the way that they know that they can or they'd like to principals and school leaders the freedom to design a school and culture uh, the way that they'd like to see it fit without having such restraint and such bureaucracy tie their hands. So that's the first thing. The second thing is when we talk about pushback from, you know, the let's say the black community or certain communities, we're not getting pushback from the people who have their children in underperforming schools. Mm -hmm. Right, so people who have their kids, or their children rather, in failing schools or underperforming schools, or even some just average schools, they are not telling us that parent choice is a bad thing. They don't, their only concern is when and where, how can we get it? Right. Uh, and we can see the evidence of that with the Alabama Accountability Act where there's 12,000 families on the who've applied in the first year. Mm -hmm. uh, so I just wanted to make that clear. So I as far as the, that. As far as the pushback from the, from the black community now, the, that we are getting, right? And that's not from the people who have their children in these, in these uh, underperforming schools. And not all schools are bad, so I'm not saying right. that. But oh, the ones yeah. who do are trapped in uh, underperforming schools, they're not pushing back. But anyway, so the pushback we are getting, it first comes from uh, the fact that a lot, there's this distrust between the black community and the white community. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, blacks feel like, especially here in Alabama, that you know the white Republicans who are pushing this school choice stuff mm -hmm. and this charter stuff and vouchers and scholarship stuff, you know, they somehow have this evil, you know, type of mindset and they're trying to destroy public education for the black people and you know that there's this distrust here from years of racism and hatred mm -hmm. that has happened and you know all of the riots and the march just just holding on to that to that hurt 
Um, mm -hmm. That's been happening for so many years here. So now that they're saying, hey, we the Republicans are saying, hey, we care about low income families and we want to help them. It doesn't sound it sounds disingenuous. Mm -hmm. Right. It, it sounds like it's bizarre and it's not it's just not true. You know, that just sounds ridiculous to a lot of folks. And so they're distrustful of that. First of all, like the messenger matters, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. And so because the messenger is these Republicans, you know, who are just out to get black people, out to get low-income folks, that they, they the, a lot of people in the community can't accept that they actually want to do something because it's right or because it's going to help. Right. So that's right. the first thing. Yeah, and I have heard that. I mean, that's a conversation I've heard in the community. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so the second pushback, the second segment of the community we're getting pushback from, is from the kind of establishment. Of the black community you know uh, everybody knows somebody that's a teacher you know th their aunt's a teacher their grandma was a teacher their uncle was an administrator you know everybody is somehow collected connected to the public school uh, space to this mm -hmm. public education arena and so because of that it has created the black middle class right mm -hmm. and so this middle class of blacks, by and large, everybody is somehow tied to the public education system. And so by saying we want to change that system because mm -hmm. it's not working for children, mm -hmm. it's like saying your family member is not good enough. Mm -hmm. It's like saying, you know, that teacher that's your grandma, that system doesn't really work anymore. And people take, and they, that's how they, that's not what it means, but that's how right. they perceive it. Right. And so they, they're very defensive of that, right? right because right. they they grew up like I, you know, I went to public. Everybody's like, I went to public school. I did just fine, right? right, right. And again, that's that middle class who is doing fine, mm -hmm. who is doing well. Like I grew up, I went to public school. I went to a, a traditional public school. I went to a magnet school. Then I went to a magnet art school for music. Mm -hmm. um, and so I went to public school. My son goes to Montevallo Elementary. He goes mm -hmm. to public school. Mm -hmm. So it's not an anti-public school thing. So to to the first point of the distrust, I would say. We have to look at these schools as an opportunity for us to educate our children. Right. Okay, the system is not working disproportionately for low-income families of all colors. Okay, and we need to look at how we can fix it. So we can look at the 100 black men of Memphis. They opened a charter school for science, technology, and math. The Delta Sigma Theta Black Sorority. They opened a charter school in Detroit for social justice, where they teach their scholars about scholarship and social justice at every level. Wow. We can look at schools like KIPP, Knowledge is Power, mm -hmm. where in Atlanta they have a school that's uh, designed around African culture, where they teach their black, their children, since they're 99% black, about African culture and West African culture. And they actually take their middle school students to Ghana, West Africa each year for their eighth grade trip. Right, And so we wow. can look at how can we use these types of schools to help our communities. Now there are art schools. Uh, Ravi Gupta has New Republic schools in Tennessee, which is of all, all races kind of attending school, but all low income. And that school went from low income troubled youth to now those kids are competing with the magnet school kids, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Not competing with some, the school is competing with the magnet schools right. as far as achievement. Right. And so you gotta look at that and say, wouldn't that be great in Alabama? And so the pushback that we get in, although it's based in, in truth, there's a lot of fear. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of, you know, past things that are still kind of, you know, fueling a lot of the anxiety. The right. messenger uh, matters in a lot of cases. Um, well, but and I'm sorry to interrupt, but, you know, we talked about boards of education even. I mean, they're the leadership within a school district. And you mentioned that uh, Bayo is working with boards of education to help them better understand these parent choice options and how they can... Um, better engage, you know, to, to help alleviate their fears. I mean, anything new, you know, it, it, when you've been doing something <laughs> this way forever and ever, is certainly going to bring up fears. Right, and so, you know, some of the boards of education have said, like some, some not the one here in Birmingham, but some board members have just flat out said they're not going to support charter schools. Mm -hmm. They just flat out said we're against, they're against it, right? Mm -hmm. And so we're trying to work to educate them on how this can be an, a valuable tool for their school system. Not something that's done to them, but something that they can do and be a part of to help their school system. Uh, and so whether that's a conversion charter school, which means they take a current school and then they turn that school into a charter school. So it'd be all the same kids, but all new adults, right? right? right. And so we're trying to teach them about just how this tool can work uh, and how it can help here uh, and in all the, you know, the different uh, school districts across the state. And some school board members didn't know a lot of this stuff. Mm -hmm. They only had heard different things from special interest groups, let's say, 
um, they have told them this is all bad, this is horrible, this is horrible, but now they're learning the facts. They're starting to see, okay, maybe this could be a tool here, or maybe we could do this one school and try it, or you know. And so, as we're talking with them and meeting with them, they're you know they're good people who want to serve and do the best they can for their communities. And so, as they learn more about this issue, they learn how they can use this tool, and we're very happy about that. But you know, we've got to be honest. Like when it comes to black elected officials, there's only been one group that's ever traditionally really supported them, and that's been the AEA, mm -hmm. right? And so for years. This, the AEA has, has, has helped create an, a space where black elected officials could have a voice and could have power, right? right? right. And so we need to be working together with the, the teachers union, the AEAs and the exactly. AFTs to see how we can use this tool to help and not hurt. So maybe that looks like uh, teachers union chapters at the charter schools, right? Or maybe that can look like wow, us yeah. working together for the union to create a charter school, right? right a pilot right, school, right. right? And so we, we don't want it to be adversarial. It's about a community coming together mm -hmm. because what we're doing right now is not working. We are very clear that what's happening in education right now is not working for right. the majority and majority disproportionately for low income and working class families. We got 66 schools on our state's failing schools list, 66. Right. Out of those 66, 41 schools are 90% black, right? So mm -hmm. there is a problem that the graduation rate for black boys in this state is 53%. That means every two black boys you see, only one is gonna graduate high school. Right in right. Montgomery County, Montgomery, the historic city, every single middle school that's not a magnet school is failing. Every one of them, every traditional middle school is failing in that county. Like right. we have a crisis, right? Right, and so going along and just doing the same thing—that's not an option. And so Bayo has a sense of urgency, and not the charters or vouchers or scholarships are going to be the magic answer, but they're a part of the solution. Right. They're going to give families options, and if you're a family that is trapped in a failing school, that is trapped in an underperforming school, you want an option. Right. Just like the people who have money have options or who you know are working really hard to afford to move to a better school district or working really hard to afford to pay for private school. Some families can't afford that. Right. And so they're trapped. And if you're one of those families, you want an option that you, can, that, that you don't have to pay for, that your kid is gonna have a great education so we can change the trajectory of their life. Because the only way, there's only one way to break generational poverty, and mm -hmm. that's through education. Right. And so that's what we wanna be able to give these communities, a good quality education, and give them access to options. So for some families, that could be the traditional public school. Right, but then for others, they might need to go to a charter school. For another, a boy might need to go to an all boys school. A girl might need to go to an art school. Like, there are different options, and we need to have access to them for our communities. Well, and I know I appreciate your passion. We need to take a quick break. So, we're going to take a quick break. We're going to come back uh, with Duncan and uh, stay tuned. Welcome back. Um, thanks for joining us again on the Alabama Way. This is the Get Connected segment uh, where we talk about schools. Uh, my name is Tricia Powell Crane. I'm the Executive Director of the Alabama School Connection, which is a, a news site for information about K-12 education. And Duncan Elliott Kirkwood has joined us today. Duncan is the State Director for the Black Alliance for Educational Options, um, or BAO, as we'll call it. Mm -hmm. And Duncan, uh, your passion is infectious. You know, I could feel myself fidgeting <laughs> in our last segment uh, because I, I really enjoy um, seeing people get empowered, that moment when, oh, okay, I have a choice. You know, I can make a choice about my child's future or my own future. And, um, and what I hear you say about BAO is that's really what this is about. Uh, it's about informing parents and helping them see their options. But I know there's a story there. Um, you must have a story to tell us about what brought you to this. I mean, where does this passion come from? Right. So I grew up in Buffalo, New York, uh, in the inner city, you know, low, very, very low income area, the type of, type of area where there's little memorials every block or so in every direction from where a child has been murdered. Um, and, you know, growing up there was, was kind of difficult, but my mother really wanted me to be different. She wanted me to be successful. So, you know, I went to a neighborhood school, down, you know, the school down the street for like, mm -hmm. till I was in the third grade or second grade. Um, and she really, really, really wanted me to be different. So she uh, had me test and I got into an academic magnet school, mm -hmm. uh, the best in the city. Uh, it's called Frederick Law Olmstead. Wow. And I stayed there from third through eighth grade. But uh, at seventh and eighth grade, I started to struggle. Mm -hmm. uh, not because I wasn't smart, 
but because the style of the learning and the school just wasn't working for me, hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. um, and so one day, you know, I'm coming home with a report card and I know I'm gonna get, you know, my butt whooped, okay? <laughs> no question about it. I've got okay. C's and D's on there. That equals oh, yeah. butt whooping. Yeah, yeah. Get home, nobody's home. And my mom had just bought Photoshop. So I put this report card on the scanner and taught myself oh, how to wow. use Photoshop, doctored the grades, okay? Gave oh, it to wow. my parents, and it was all good for 10 weeks. Uh, then my mom's an artist, so she uses expensive paper. So mm -hmm. the next report card came, I did it again, she touched the paper, she said, this isn't copy paper. Immediately I got caught, got a butt whooping, it was, it was all bad. But she learned that I was very creative, right? right. And then right. so we, she, she had me test and audition to transfer into a performing arts school. So I went mm. to a performing arts school from ninth through twelfth grade because wow. because of that. But I say that to say that you know people need different type of options. Mm -hmm. um, and I then because I went to those schools, I went to Alabama State University. Mm -hmm. um, I came down here. Then I joined the military. I worked for a city councilor. Mm -hmm. I'm still in the Army National Guard, serving our state of Alabama. Mm -hmm. uh, then kind of got into this ed reform movement. But I look at my friends that I grew up with in that same neighborhood. Three of them are dead. You know, two in jail, and the rest of them are still in the ne same neighborhood, living mm -hmm. at the same houses, sitting on the porch, you know, doing nothing with their lives. And mm -hmm. that's because they went to a different school. You know, they went to the neighborhood school that was right. awful. You mm -hmm. know, they, they did, their parents didn't push them, you know, and, and they didn't have those same opportunities. And I just think, what if they would have had right. the same choices or opportunities that I would have had in those better schools? And so now I come to Alabama, when I came here, I realized that. Families don't have any choices. It's like there are magnet schools, but they are few and far between. Right. And so, by and large, the bulk of everyone is going to these traditional schools. And a lot of them are not doing well. Now, some of them are doing great. Mm -hmm. Some of them are on the rise. Mm -hmm. you know, But a lot of them are not doing well. And so it really, it really touches me personally because being someone who made it out of that situation, I felt mm -hmm. guilty. right? Like mm -hmm. I, I made it out, and then I left. Right? Yeah. I left to come down south for a better life, to have opportunity and try to make something of myself. Mm -hmm. And I feel guilty at times. So being able to do this work helps to make me feel better mm -hmm. uh, to, that I'm helping other families so they won't have that same situation. And I'm, I'm sorry, that was kind of long. but No, no, I appreciate that. And we're glad you're here. You know, I mean, um, I, one of the, the, the void of communication that ever makes it out to the community, any community, uh, it's difficult. You know, our media is... Um, struggling. I mean, we just have a tough time getting information to the public. So your organization doing this, um, you know, and you and I talked about, you, you don't just work with black families, right? I right. mean, if, if a white family or Hispanic family comes to one of your sign-up uh, sessions, of, I know that y'all conducted some last year with the, with the Alabama Accountability Act scholarships, they're not turned away. That's so right. this is all families. That's right. So right. we just, you know, the reason we're called the Black Alliance for Education Options is because we want the black community to have a voice in this education reform movement. Right. But we want all schools to be great. We want all families to have options. So mm -hmm. we help, we've helped sign up white families, Hispanic families for the scholarship through mm -hmm. the Alabama Opportunity Scholarship Fund. We help anybody who wants that scholarship. We want to help them. Mm -hmm. And to speak to that, uh, the Alabama Accountability Act, yeah, yeah. Um, that law has been so twisted, right? So there are three parts to the law, okay? okay? Part one gives public schools flexibility to improve right. their schools. Right. Part two gives families a tax credit. So if you pay for private school on the front end, mm -hmm. right, you take your kid out of a failing school, put them in a private school, on, and you pay for it on the front end, mm -hmm. in the spring when you file your taxes, you can get a tax credit. Right. That's the part where everybody's like, oh, see, a lot of people aren't taking advantage of it because there weren't that many people who took advantage of that, right? Right, right. But then there is the bulk, which is what we focus on, which is the scholarship. Right. Which means if you're a low-income family, you make, you know, you fall into that low income range, right. then you can apply to get a scholarship for uh, 5000 for a K through 5 student, mm -hmm. 6500 for a middle student, or 8000 for a high school student. Mm, okay. And they, the scholarship will be given to your family, and then you will choose what school you want to go to with that scholarship, mm -hmm. what private school, or to use that scholarship to pay out of zone fees right. to go to a different public school. Right, right. And right. so we've spent our work making sure that families and communities know about that scholarship. Mm -hmm. We help them do the application. We work with the scholarship fund, the Alabama Opportunity Scholarship Fund, who do an amazing job mm -hmm. at, at creating as much access to that scholarship as possible for folks. Mm -hmm. um, and that is a, a game, that was a game changer when they passed that law in Alabama. Now when they passed it, 
No Democrats voted for it. Mm -hmm. All Republicans just voted for it. But that. in this past legislative session, the cap was 25 million. That cap has now been raised to 30 million. Mm -hmm. So more kids can get a scholarship. And during that vote, 16 black Democrats voted in favor of raising that cap, voted in favor mm -hmm. of amending that law. And so we're seeing progress. This isn't a Democrat thing or a Republican thing. Education should not be political. I agree. Education should be about what's in the best interest of the children. Right. And the Accountability Act was our first major, mm -hmm. you know, kind of step into this movement. It was our foray into parent choice. And although it started off rocky, as most things do, mm -hmm. we have thousands and thousands of families on scholarship right now and even more on the wait list. And so we want those families who are on the wait list to come out and say, hey, legislature, let's, let's raise the cap next year. Let's raise it to 50 million. Let's get more kids scholarships. Um, because at the end of the day, a parent should have the choice to do what's best for their child. Well, and I appreciate that. Um, I think that the Accountability Act has been, it's been difficult to decipher for some folks. Um, you know, I've written a lot about it on the Alabama School Connection but getting the information to families in a way that really makes it understandable. You know, can I, uh, am I eligible for this scholarship? What does this mean for my child? Um, and, and we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, I want to talk just briefly about um, how parents can, you know, picking a private school, right? I mean, if so I'm eligible for a scholarship, but how do I know if this is a good private school? Because like you said, it's not a magic bullet and there are as many, you know, not well-performing private schools as there are not well-performing public schools. So uh, we're going to talk about that in just a moment and uh, we're going to talk about charter schools. So stay tuned. Welcome back. Thanks for joining us again. Um, this is the Get Connected segment of the Alabama Way and today I, my name is Tricia Crane. I'm the Executive Director of the Alabama School Connection but I'm so excited I forget my name sometimes. Um, Duncan at Duncan Elliott Kirkwood, who is the State Director for the Black Alliance for Educational Options, or BAO, is here to talk with us about parent choice. I had said school choice, and Duncan said mm -hmm. it's parent choice. It gives parents options. So right before we took a break, we were talking a little bit about the Alabama Accountability Act, the tax credit scholarships. Um, I refer to them as tax credit scholarships, really for parents who are, are getting them their scholarships. And um, I know that Bayo has done a lot of work in helping parents understand whether or not their children are eligible for these scholarships. And also, you know, there is this thing, okay, now I've got a scholarship, now what? Right. Uh, you know, you've got these private schools that you've got to look at, and how do you know? And if it's a, if it's a good private school, could you talk a little bit about that? So, so first, to qualify is an income guideline, so you have to make okay. less than twice the national poverty Okay. Um, amount and the easiest way to think about that is do they qualify for free and reduced lunch okay um, so that's the first thing and then once the, the scholarship if they're the only requirement is their income okay and then priority is to give in to those who uh, have children in a failing school right but even if your child's not in a failing school and you meet the income guideline you can apply okay um, so that's the that's the criteria for, for the scholarships once a family gets it and they're gonna choose a private school we want families to know every private school is not great Right. Every private school is not better than the traditional public school that your child is in. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's important that we as Bayo and this movement of uh, ed reform, you know, folks, educate parents to let them know, like, hey, here are the choices of schools in your area. And he, like, you need to do a site visit. We're going to take uh, families on site visits and we need to uh, find ways to evaluate the schools. Uh, right. and educate parents on how good these schools are. So they're not, we're not giving people choice for choice sake. We want high quality options. We don't want the illusion of choice. We want high quality options for these, for these families. Right. Um, and so that's kind of, that, and they can contact Bay and we'll help them with the whole process. Great, um, and I know there's a 1-800 number which will be on the screen. Yes. Um, and they can contact uh, families who are interested in scholarships or help with choosing a private school can contact Bayo. Absolutely. Okay. Well, all right, now we're going to get to the meat of this, right? This is about charter schools. Right. Um, charter schools uh, legislation passed earlier this year. Um, the idea is that charter schools, the first charter schools won't open until probably the 2016-17 school year. Mm -hmm. The guidelines and the rules are being written. Um, but I know that you've been, you know, at the ground level, foundation level. What would you like to share with us about charter schools? Okay, so first thing I always have to say is charter schools are public schools. Yes. I want to say it again. Charter schools are public schools. Right. The difference is that they're run by a nonprofit. 
Okay. okay. So for example, the 100 Black Men or A Plus Alabama or you know a, 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 a you know a nonprofit that's for art or science, like any okay. any type of nonprofit could has that nonprofit has to be the one to hold the charter to okay. to apply and get the charter from the uh, local school board, and charter schools are non-selective which means they will take all the kids that apply space available okay. so if a school holds 400 kids and 396 kids apply all 396 are getting in even the special needs children exactly okay they have to serve as special needs students as well right. if a school holds 400 people and 500 apply right mm -hmm. then they have to have a random lottery Okay. for those students and it's not like a random lottery it's a real random lottery old bingo balls everybody gets a number and they rake the balls and pull them one by one okay. and again special needs students are included in that charter schools do service special needs students the reason that we're excited about charter schools is because a charter school has so much freedom and flexibility mm -hmm. to really impact a community so some charter schools stay open till five o'clock uh, mm -hmm. So instead of you having to take your kid from school to after school or, or whatever, mm -hmm. the school day is just longer. And I don't mean they had this, the school day is longer where they have after school care. No, they just have longer classes each day. Mm -hmm. You know, some charter schools have Saturday school or year round school. Some mm -hmm. are like all boys school or art school. Uh, some have, you know, they all have varying types of themes. Mm -hmm. And priority for charter schools is given to the families in the community. Okay. So a charter school is not going to open and people and you know it's going to fill up with folks from out of town or okay. the next county over. Uh, the priority is given to uh, families that are living in that community and then if there's space available after that then other folks will be able to apply you know and get into that charter school as well. Okay. Uh, there's also an accountability piece. So if a charter school after five years is failing, if they're like awful and they're not doing the job that they're supposed to do, mm -hmm. then that charter school can be closed. Mm -hmm. And that and that nonprofit will have that charter revoked from them. Okay. Um, another thing people say about charter schools is that charter schools cherry pick the best kids. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And so a couple, th first of all, that's just not true, right? Mm -hmm. That's a, that the law clearly states that they are non-selective, right. okay? Right. Uh, that's number one. But number two is when, when people say that, the, that argument came from if, the charter schools were taken, they're opening in communities, kids were going to these schools from these low income communities and from these other failing schools, and they were excelling in these charter schools. So people's logic was, well, you must have taken the best kids. Mm -hmm. That's the only way that those kids could have excelled. And to me, what I hear is what you're saying is, the only way that these low income kids could be successful is if you skimmed the top, right? You took all of the straight A best students out of the school. and. That means that you don't believe that the kids in this school originally could excel, mm -hmm. right? And that's not something that we believe. Okay. And that should be offensive. When people hear that, oh, charter schools cherry pick, what they're saying is, y'all kids can't learn. Mm -hmm. So they had to take the rarities, the anomalies out of the school, and now somehow they're excelling, but the other kids can't anymore. No, that's an excuse. If a school is failing and kids are failing in a school, we need to make changes, mm -hmm. period. Mm -hmm. Not accept it and blame other parents. We need to make changes. Right. And so charter schools gives that, that freedom for us teachers, for school leaders to really teach, to really hone in, to tailor their class. Some charter schools have two teachers in a classroom. One charter school I visited, she intentionally hired more black men mm -hmm. than fe black females for elementary school mm -hmm. because she felt like this was a low income area and they needed to see a black man in a suit every day who was educated and who had gone to college because right. otherwise they would have never seen it. Wow. Right. And so and that's the, and it's not just a black thing. Right. So there's right. Uh, there are Hispanic char charter schools that cater more towards Hispanic students. There are charter schools that are all mixed 50, 50, 60, mm -hmm. 40, all races. Um, it's a place where we can really have diversity, but we can also celebrate people's differences and uniquenesses. Um, I think that it's it's a great opportunity for Alabama, and we're finally moving in a direction of passing policy that's in the best interest of children. Mm -hmm. uh, because even if you have, like I said before, if you have a good school, it might not work for both kids. It might work for one kid, right. but your other child might need something different. Mm -hmm. And having the ability to choose is powerful. So we hope that families will you know, get behind this. We'll continue to educate and convene and empower families so that they will understand this. And if you're saying, hey, the school that my kids go to isn't working, Let's advocate and push the school board to say, let's convert that school to a charter. Let's bring in KIPP, 
or idea or a rocket ship schools. Well, let's bring in a provider that knows how it is an expert in educating low income kids and making them, you know, graduation rates 100%, mm -hmm. college acceptance rates 100%. Why would someone fight that? If we could tell you a provider would come in and they would make within three years a school in the lowest income area in the most at-risk community where they'd have a graduation rate of 100%, college acceptance rate of 100% mm -hmm. every year, why would someone fight that? Exactly. Right. And so that's what that's what we want. Now, every charter school isn't going to be that great. Right. 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 But for the ones that are not good, we mm -hmm. want to see them close. Mm -hmm. See, that's the problem we have now. When we have underperforming schools, we just let them keep going. Mm -hmm. And we just herd kids into those schools year after year. Right. right. So what we want is a system of accountability like charter schools have, where if a school is is doing amazing, we see that replicated. Mm -hmm. We like if a charter school in Birmingham has got 100 percent graduation, 100 percent college acceptance. This, they're just knocking it out of the park. We want to open one of those schools in Dothan, right? right and then right. Selma, and et cetera, et cetera. But if a school opens in Birmingham and it's awful, mismanagement of money, hired the wrong people, mm -hmm. well, we want to see it closed right. immediately. As opposed to what we do now with traditional schools is if the school isn't working, we just keep sending kids there. And right. we just shuffle the teachers around to other schools and you know, we just hope that one day that we'll end up with better teachers and we just tell the families, just wait, in a few years it'll get better. Um, and that's just unacceptable. Well, and I, I appreciate that. I, you know, your, your message is, it's clear. I mean, you, you speak very well about this issue and about this topic, and that's why I appreciate you coming and sitting here with us today and sharing this with our viewers. Um, your contact information will be on the screen, and, uh, you know, this is just the beginning of the conversation, right? right? I mean, you know, First Charter School hasn't even opened. So, but I appreciate you laying this out in a way that, that we can understand it. Your message is a bit different than, than a lot of the messages that are out there. Um, and I think people have been fearful. And what I'm hearing you say is this is an opportunity. This is not something to be afraid of. So I really appreciate your time today, Duncan. Thank you for being here. And, uh, and, and I'm sure that our viewers will see you again. Thank you very much for having me. Absolutely. And, and just, just want to say charter yeah. schools are not the magic answer. Right. They're just another tool in the toolbox. You're exactly right. That's important to remember. Thank you for being with us today.